What's up, guys, and welcome to another MMA Minute mini show. We got some trending topics. You can see it here to my right. Timestamps are going to be down below. Carlos Prates, I want to talk about his pound for pound elite power. Um, we had what I think the new gloves myth that people are talking about in the MMA community. I think it's been debunked at this point. Um, you'll hear my thoughts on that. John Jones, his legacy by ducking Tom Aspinall and taking the fight with Stipe. Does that break his legacy? And then, of course, we have UFC 309 coming up. So, yeah, like I said, uh, timestamps are going to be down below. I'm going to talk about the trending topics today. Make sure to hit that like button, comment below, and subscribe to the channel. we got to get the algorithm moving. We need to grow the channel. So any support you guys can give me, it would be much appreciated. So Carlos Prates is coming off another knockout win. So that is now four wins in a row in the UFC, five if you count his Dana White's Contender Series win. And I'll tell you what, guys, pound for pound, if you were to make a, a quick list, pound for pound, most power in the UFC, I think Carlos Pretas is cracking your top five. And personally, he might even be cracking my top three. The only other names I could really think of that stood out for people in their division having massive amounts of power that probably translate to an even higher weight class. I'm thinking of guys like Alex Pereira, which is a pretty obvious one. Ilya Taporia, another pretty obvious one because he just knocked, knocked out Volkanovski and Max Holloway at 145. And then I kind of feel like Carlos Prates might just fit into that number three spot pound for pound wise. This guy has the legitimate touch of death. It, it is reminiscent of Anderson Silva he's extremely cocky he fights with his hands low um, cocky to a fault should I say like he plays it very cool there was moments in that fight where I thought Magny was actually either going to get a takedown or get enough clinch time and just get some wear and tear going on protest to maybe slow him down that didn't actually work out for Neil Magny I thought the game plan was there but as soon as protest hit this guy he was done, and and the and the funny part was if you actually go back and watch it, he barely grazed the head of Neil Magny, but it was it was enough to like literally force this guy to just collapse and get knocked out. And Neil Magny, yeah, I mean he's been finished a couple of times, but he's generally a pretty durable guy. Great cardio, can go all five rounds, and Prates just nuked him. Anytime they had some space between them, Prates got aggressive. He was moving forward, and you could just get that sense that at some point, Pratis was going to land the kill shot, and he did. Like As soon as he touches you, he gets you out of there. We've seen it in the past. Like Even just a jab from this guy knocks you down. If he hits you with the right hand, you're going down. And if even if he grazes you like he did against Neil Magny, you're going down and you're going out. Like it, it's, it's ridiculous what this guy is doing, and it does remind me a little bit of, of Anderson Silva. And he's doing it against... Pretty decent levels of competition. He is getting moved slowly up the ladder. Neil Magny was, uh, I believe, number 15 in the division. So now he's going to be cracking the top 15. So his call out of Jeff Neal, I kind of like it. I actually think that's a pretty decent fight to make. Jeff Neal sitting at that number 10 spot. Jeff Neal's pretty much been a staple in this division for years now. I don't think he's really going to make any leaps and bounds forward at this point not going to challenge for a belt not going to crack the top five i think you give carlos Prates a a chance to enter into the top 10 i actually like that fight for him a lot so um yeah like i said i just think what i'm seeing out there is that this guy just holds insane power where i think he can actually make a living off of it you know some we've seen people before kind of be one-dimensional and they rely on that power, and that can be their downfall. But I think he could be one of the few guys that actually gets to the top with that power. So I'm interested to see where his career goes. I'm not buying all in, but I'm I'm very close to it. If he goes out there and finishes a guy like Jeff Neal, like take all my money. Like I'm all in on Carlos Pratas. So and especially because he's now training with the fighting nerds. Like these dudes are literally taking over the UFC. It's probably the best gym going right now. Um, not necessarily in terms of champions, but future champions. They got options, and Carlos Prates fits right into that mix. So um, kind of another funny thing here that kind of plays right into Carlos Prates is that basically the new gloves the UFC has issued, people have been saying that we're not seeing you know, as many knockouts or TKOs as we saw in the past, 
And for a while, you know, it was pretty funny. I kind of thought maybe it might be true. Maybe it might not. But kind of in the last few weeks, I feel like that myth has been debunked at this point. I mean, we saw plenty of power on this card of all cards, UFC Vegas 100. Everyone was ranking this like a one out of 10 card, but we saw a ton of finishes. Carlos Pratis got the knockout. Um, Romeus in his fight, you know, he hurt Bolanos pretty bad in that fight. Abdul Malik hurt Dusko a bunch of times before getting the finish. Um, easy dose against Zach Scroggin just dominated him on the feet. Charles Radke got the finish over semi the Jedi in less than a minute, landing some massive shots on the feet. And then even last week, um, no, the week before that we had Dustin Stoltzfus over Mark Andre Barrio also get a massive knockout win. So if those dudes are able to get a knockout, I got to imagine the gloves are just fine. Ilya Teporia just knocked out Max Holloway, the greatest chin of all time. I don't think it's the gloves, right? Like at this point, I think it's fair to say that that myth has been debunked. That's maybe it was just a coincidence this whole time. Maybe it's just the new age of MMA. It's just more competitive. Fighters are smarter. Um, the, I think the fight IQ is a little bit better. They're more technical in there. They're more well-rounded. I, I just think maybe the sport is better. So we're seeing less knockouts. Maybe that's what it is because there definitely was a decrease maybe it was like five percent overall of like knockouts and tkos we were seeing as compared to before but i think more than anything it was probably just coincidence so to me the myth was debunked and i'm kind of curious to what you guys think because i don't know if anyone's actually provided some hard data on it it was kind of like a funny thing going around the mma community but at this point i think we're okay i think we're going to see plenty of knockouts uh, between now and in the future ufc 309 is coming up that's John Jones taking on Stipe. John Jones has really been the talk of the town for, um, it feels like, these last few weeks, last few months. Because, and actually just recently, because he came out and said that he is ducking Tom Aspinall. Said it without actually saying it. And saying that his next fight's going to be against Alex Pereira instead. So, um, he's in charge of his legacy. He basically just said, I'm going to pick the fights that's going to, you know, play into my story. So that when he walks away, he'll be undefeated. He'll have the big names on his resume. I understand that. So by doing that, he is ducking Tom Aspinall. I feel like that is just a fact. He, he doesn't want to fight the current best heavyweight in the division and instead is taking other fights for his legacy, being selfish, writing his own story. That's literally him ducking Tom Aspinall. So I've seen people say this, that if he is ducking Tom Aspinall, that's actually going to hurt his legacy. That, to me, is insane. To the people that are saying that this this chapter of John Jones's legacy, that this even matters when you're trying to compare him as the greatest fighter of all time to some of the other guys, this is just the icing on the cake. I, I don't even really understand where people are going with this. We said, if you asked me five years ago, who's the greatest fighter of all time? It's John Jones. If you ask me today... It's John Jones. Like, you know what I mean? Like, he was already the greatest fighter of all time. Everything he's been doing since 2020, that was the last fight that he had at 205. Everything that he's doing at heavyweight is basically irrelevant. It's just the, it's the sugar on top. It's the cherry on top. Like, this guy has went through generations of talent. He's been in the UFC since August 9th of 2008. Got the belt in 2011. He was the youngest champion of all time. And then from there, he just went on an absolute war path and just set records along the way. So, um, obviously, two-time light heavyweight champion, right? He had some of his reins broken up there because he had some not-so-great things going on in his life. Um, or was potentially cheating. I don't know. But So, he's a two-time light heavyweight champion. He has 11 successful title defenses okay he was the longest light heavyweight champion ever with 1500 days of being a champion he has the most wins in ufc title fights with 15 he has the most ufc title fights in general with 16 second most submissions in ufc title fights uh tied with mighty mouse for third most finishes in ufc title fights like as i just mentioned the youngest fighter ever to become a ufc champion uh, eighth multi-divisional champion in UFC history because he did move to heavyweight. And I just want to right there also say that 
his move to heavyweight, we waited so long for him to actually make that decision. We didn't know how he was going to look. He didn't fight a scrub. I, I hate this narrative too. He fought Cyril Gaon, a guy that I've been following for a long time now and who I actually believe was probably the best heavyweight in the division until John Jones came into the mix and until Tom Aspinall kind of had his ascension. I thought Cyril Gaon was the guy. I thought he should have beat Francis Ngannou, and he really should have because he made one bonehead mistake. Francis took advantage of it and barely squeaked out a decision, but Cyril Gaon is a legitimate heavyweight guy john jones goes in there and subs him in two minutes i kind of feel like that's one of the most underrated wins of john jones's career so all those things that he did at light heavyweight at 205 he was already considered the greatest champion of all time moves up in weight beats Cyril gone convincingly in two minutes so now he's a double champ two different weight classes that just added to his legacy that just further made him the greatest of all time which he already was it further made him the greatest fighter of all time and ducking tom aspinall literally means nothing this is a comparison that i want to make like think about tom brady six super bowl wins before he went to tampa bay right he was already the greatest quarterback of all time if he had went to tampa bay and people were saying like oh if he doesn't get a you know another ring here he can't be the greatest of all time nobody was saying that if he went to tampa bay and lost in the playoffs in the first round, he's still the greatest quarterback of all time. Now, you know, Tom Brady got another ring. That's uh, neither here nor there, but um, that's just crazy. It'd be like saying Michael Jordan still needed to win another ring when he went to the Wizards to become the greatest of all time. And if he didn't, that was going to hurt his legacy. If Tom Brady went to Tampa Bay, didn't win another ring, that was going to hurt his legacy. Those are ridiculous statements, and the same is true for John Jones. Whether or not he fights Tom Aspinall doesn't matter. Even if he goes out there and loses to Stipe this weekend, which he won't, um, that doesn't affect his legacy. He's already the greatest fighter of all time. He's already done so much for the sport and in this sport. It just doesn't matter. He is past his prime. Let's not worry about it. Like He is past his prime. Let's not worry about what a 40-year-old John Jones could have done if he fought Tom Aspinall tomorrow, who's what, 28 years old in his prime, Tom's probably going to win that fight. It just doesn't matter because John Jones is past his prime. I do believe that. Um, but everything else he did in the past made him the greatest fighter of all time. What he does between now and the end of his career doesn't matter. Anything that he wins is just the cherry on top. So I've seen people out there questioning the legacy of John Jones especially when it comes down to picking Stipe over Tom Aspinall. And I'm here to tell you that that is just straight insanity. It doesn't matter. He is going to be the greatest fighter of all time, no matter what. End of rant. So, yes, we do have UFC 309 on the horizon. John Jones versus Stipe. You have just two older guys, 37 years old and John Jones, 42 years old and Stipe. Is it going to be the most exciting fight we've ever seen? Probably not. Both of these guys are past their primes, but we need to move the John Jones, you know, storyline forward. Like he's, he was supposed to fight Stipe over a year ago. Let's get this done with. It's not the worst main event I've ever seen, but I'm not super excited for it. However, the co-main five rounds, I believe Charles Oliveira, Michael Chandler, the rematch. Charles Oliveira got the finish the first time around after nearly getting finished by Michael Chandler. This is going to be just an absolute barn burner. Nothing is going to change. Both guys are a little bit older, but they are just as dangerous as they were back then. That's where this card pretty much makes its money, right? People will pay to see John Jones. I do understand that. But the co-main, if you're in the MMA community today, that's the fight you want to see. Bo Nichols minus 1,000 versus Paul Craig. That seems like an insane number. I'm going to take Paul Craig by sub just by default. Not a great fight, not a terrible fight, but it'll probably be pretty boring unless Paul Craig somehow goes in there and pulls off a wild submission, which he has done before. Um, Araujo taking on Karine Silva. You know, it's just another fight to get Karine Silva moving up the rankings, the younger fighter with the higher ceiling. And then opening the main card is Mauricio Rufi um, taking on James Lontop. Not a great fight. Not a great fight. There's a couple of other decent matchups in there. 
Um, when you're looking at the prelims, Jonathan Martinez, Marcus McGee, Chris Weidman's on the card taking on Eric Anders. That's going to be a horrible fight. Jim Miller's on the card taking on Damon Jackson. We have Marcin Tybora, Jonata Denise. That should be a fun one. Um, maybe Basil Hafez versus Oban Elliott's a decent scrap, but overall, it, it's not a great card. I'm not going to lie to you. The main card could use some work, um, but those. I don't know. Maybe three matchups on there that we want to see. Everyone wants to see Bo Nickel get back in there. I understand that. The co-main's an absolute banger. And then we want to just see John Jones dominate Stipe, uh, make his call out for Alex Pereira, and then we'll wrap it up. So that's UFC 309 taking place at Madison Square Garden, which is an awesome venue. The fans will definitely be out, and it'll be a sold-out event. So um, that's really what's going on in the UFC today. Thanks for watching. If you haven't, like subscribe, comment down below, and we'll see you guys next time.